Now I'm going to create a TCP echo server in Rust from scratch without any kind of library like Tokyo for instance. I'm solely going to leverage the bare minimum here and only going to use the standard library provided by Rust. So I think we are going to have a lot of fun in this video. So let's just get right into it. So I assume that you are already familiar what a basic TCP echo server is. If not, it's a really simple TCP server that just echoes back the same message the client has sent to the server. Sounds pretty straightforward, right? Well, we'll see about that in a minute. So what the game plan really is here is that we are going to set up a TCP echo server that can accept connections from a client through a specific port. And then the client sends a message to the server. Then the server is going to receive this message and then the server is actually going to echo this kind of message or any really sequence of bytes exactly as the RFC document states to the client back. So that really we have some sort of echoing. So the client just sends any sequence of bytes or any message to the server and the server echoes back this message to the client. Okay, let's just get into the code here. Okay, what we got here is a really simple plain Rust project with a simple main function. Now we're going to start writing and start creating our TCP echo server. So what we're going to do first is we are going to create a simple function called handle client. Now this handle client function literally just handles one single client. That's really important to know here because in the end our server should be able to accept multiple clients. So we are going to implement this function later here. Let's just focus on the main functionality. Okay, so what we are going to do first is that we are going to determine the address and the port we are going to listen on or the server is going to listen on. And we are going to make this a bit more dynamic through a really simplified CLI here. So what we're going to do is we are going to just say address and then we are going to use env from the scd env package and then we're going to say arcs and then we take the first and then we're going to unwrap or else. We are just going to create a simple closure here and then we are going to default back to a simple local address here. Now, quick explanation here, what we got is env and then args. Now, this is literally just an iterator over the command line arguments passed to the program. And env1 is literally just the second or in computer science terms, the first command line argument. Because the first command line argument is always usually the program itself. And then whenever we do not really define any kind of address, we are just going to hop into this or else statement here. And then we are going to execute this closure, which in the end just returns a default address that we are going to use for the server. Right, so whenever this nth one here returns none, which just returns an option, so it can return the address or none basically. And then whenever it returns none, we are just going to use this default address here. All right, let's just create our first listener here. We're just going to create listener and then we're going to leverage TCP listener from the STD net library. And then we're going to say bind and then we're going to use address. Also, what's important to note here is that address has to be a reference to a string. And we can actually see this in the definition of the function as well. And that's why we are passing in the reference to the address because obviously the bind method will not take ownership of this address variable. Now this, as you can see here, will return a result. And for now, we are just going to expect this binding functionality. So whenever this binding functionality fails, for whatever reason, we're going to say failed to bind to address. Now, what does this line mean here? Literally just attempts to create a server socket bound to a specified address, which we've defined here as the reference to our address variable. Binding in this terms just means that the OS reserves that address and port for this program to listen on. Now, obviously this can fail, for instance, like an invalid port or the port is already in use. And that's why we have here this expect and that's why this bind actually returns an IO result. Now in real production code, obviously you would handle this ever more gracefully because this expect really causes a panic and a failure in the end. And this is not really what we want in production code. Let's just use a print line here and let's just print the address. So let's just say server listening on and then we say address. And now we can continue with waiting for an incoming connection from a client. So what we can do to actually wait for a client 
is we can say listener.incoming. And as you can see here, this incoming returns an iterator over the connections being received on this listener. Therefore, we're going to create a loop. So we are going to say for and then stream result in listener.incoming because it is an iterator. Now, what does this line actually mean here? So like I said before, this just waits for incoming connections and incoming, like I said earlier, returns an iterator that blocks, which is really important to know, so it waits until a client attempts to connect to the server. And then when the client connects, it just yields a result. And this loop will run forever and really processes one connection attempt at a time. Okay, let's just quickly check here because stream result is a result we need to kind of handle this result and therefore we're going to use match here and then we say stream result. Now here we are going to just see if the connection attempt was successful and if it was successful, it just returns the normal stream, which is of type TCP stream. And in here, we basically can say that the client successfully connects to the server and then we can handle the client. Now, if not, there is an error now, this error normally occurred while trying to accept a connection. This can be due to system limits, for instance. And what we're going to say here is just use the ePrint line functionality. And here we're going to say failed to accept connection. And then we're going to print the error as well. So right here, we are just printing the error, right? And we are still trying to accept new connections. And with this ePrint line, we are printing to the standard error instead of the standard output. Okay, so let's get back to our handling of the stream here. What we're going to say is we are going to spawn a new thread because we do not want to really block the handling of the client or the handling functionality of the client. And therefore, we're going to spawn a new thread and then in this thread, handle the client. So we can literally kind of concurrently handle multiple clients. So what we can say is threat. We use this standard thread here and then we say spawn and then we create a closure. We are going to use the move keyword here and then we're going to call handle client and we are going to pass in the stream because we need to kind of get the data from the stream and we also need to send the data to the stream. So let's just quickly explain this functionality. What does this OK block mean here? Now here again, like I said earlier, handling this connection without using concurrency would really block the main loop in this case and would in the end block accepting new clients. And therefore we use thread spawn to really create and start a new thread of execution to really handle the clients concurrently. Now this move keyword, I've already made a video just specifically about this move keyword, but in the end, it just gives the new thread ownership of the stream variable. It's worth noting though that this is not perfect because under heavy load, this system might fail because we spawn a new thread for every single connection. Now this can be optimized with Tokyo for instance, but we don't really care right now, but you can optimize this if you really want to. Now, like I said, then this handle client functionality just runs then in a separate thread for each specific client. And then after spawning the thread, the main loop immediately continues and blocks again and waits for an incoming connection. So hopefully this makes sense here. All right, let's just go back to the handle client function. And obviously we're going to take in the stream here as a function parameter. Now, like I said, this handle client function is just the core logic for dealing with a single connection and it should take ownership of the TCP stream, which really represents the connection established between the server and one specific client. So what we're going to say here is mod stream and then TCP stream. So no reference, we're just going to take ownership of this stream here. In this case, the mod keyword really means that we can modify the stream. So specifically by reading from it, and really writing to it. In here, what we can do is just get the peer address, which could be really interesting. So here we are just going to print the peer address of who basically connected to our server. And here we are going to say stream, and then we say peer address, it's that simple. And then we're going to say map or else. In here we are going to create a closure, and then we're going to say unknown dot to string. Now this can be quite confusing here, this map or else, but it's really easy to understand. So what we got here for the peer address is a result again, an IO result. And clearly we need to kind of handle this result or unmap the value of this result. So what we're going to leverage here is map or else. So with this map or else, 
the first closure here is the else and then we have the map closure which is this here in the map closure we're going to get the address and then we're going to use to string because in the end we're just going to want to print the peer address however if there is a specific error or we cannot really get the result or get the value out of the result we're just going to execute this closure here and we're going to return unknown in this case all right that's pretty cool so let's just print this peer address here so we're going to say handling connection from and then we're going to say peer address cool pretty good stuff so now we need kind of a place to temporarily store the data we actually read from the client before we really echo it back now what we're going to say here is just let mod buffer and then we're going to do this weird syntax here. I'm going to explain this, what this really means. What we're going to say here with this line is that we are going to create a byte array, which in the end is just a fixed size chunk of memory of 1024 bytes. Now with this syntax here, we are also going to initialize all the bytes, all the 1024 bytes with zero. Now this size is somewhat arbitrary, but pretty common in this TCP EchoServe example. What's really important to know here is that larger buffers really might be slightly more efficient for large messages, but obviously they use more memory. So it's really a trade-off here. Okay, what we're going to say is we are going to create an infinite loop. So this kind of infinite loop is going to run as long as the client is connected and sending data to the server and here we're going to now attempt to read the data from the client stream into our buffer and we can actually achieve this with stream.read now this stream.read just tries to fill the buffer with the bytes sent by the client it's also worth noting that this is still a blocking operation and really waits until the client just sends some data so what we can do is we can because this read just takes in a mutable reference to a buffer we can say reference mutable and then buffer because this read now returns a result again we are going to use the match here and then we basically have two ways this just creates the successful value this n or this u size really holds the number of bytes read from the client and this okay is executed whenever the read was successful now what we're going to do then is to just use the error here and then we're going to say if the kind of the error is equal to io error kind and then interrupt it and if it is the case, we are just going to continue the loop here. Now, why are we actually going to do this? I think generally you do not really need this sort of error check. However, this is still good practice because in the end, the read operation can sometimes be interrupted by signals. Now, when this happens, the OS literally returns an error indicating that the operation was interrupted. But it does not necessarily mean that the connection is broken or that the data is lost. And that's why we are going to continue our loop here. And then we're going to actually get all the other errors or catch all the other errors with this error statement here. Now again, we are going to match the e dot kind. And in here, we are going to check for the connection reset kind. And if this is the case, we're just going to print something to the console. And for now, we are going to say client reset connection. And here we're going to use the peer address. Pretty simple. Then we're going to apply the wildcard pattern. So basically matching any other error kind. And then again, print something to the standard error here. Read error from client. Then we're going to use peer address and the error itself. And then clearly, if we do have any sort of other error than the error interrupted, we're going to break out of this loop and we are going to and the connection. Now, what is going on here with the connection reset? Why are we actually doing this? Now, this is a common error, which just means in the end that the client forcibly closed the connection. Now, this could, for instance, mean that the program crashed or they lost the connection to the network. And before we actually handle this, okay, let's just get out of the loop here. And then we are going to print line something to the console again, connection finished for, and here we're going to say P address again. 
Now, what is really cool is that we do not necessarily need to clean up the resources here. So that really means that we do not really need to manually close the connection here because of Rust's ownership principles. Because this function takes ownership of the stream variable and it goes here out of scope. And then the underlying network connection associated with the stream is automatically closed and cleaned up. This has something to do with the drop trade, which I'm going to probably make a custom video about. Okay, pretty nice. Let's just get back to the okay here and let's implement the actual logic. So what we're going to do first is somehow a sanity check. What we're going to say is if n is equal to zero, then we break and we exit the loop. And here we're going to say print line client closed the connection. Now, why we are going to do this is pretty straightforward. In TCP streams, usually reading zero bytes just indicates that the client has closed this side of the connection gracefully, which is often in networking called end of file or EOF. And here really this if branch really means that we handle the EOF, which in the end just means the client closed the connection gracefully. And then we are going to clearly exit the loop here. And then we are going to do something magical again. So we are going to, in the end, need to echo back the red bytes, which are currently in our buffer. So how are we going to do this? It's pretty straightforward. We're going to say stream write all, and then we're going to use the buffer here. Now I'm going to optimize this line here in a minute because really this write all just returns a result again and we need to handle this error so we're going to say if let error e is equal to this then we're just going to e print line write error to client and then we're going to break so if there is an error for the write all function we are going to break out of this loop and we're going to print this message here or this string in this case to the standard error output. And if the write all was successful, then we are basically here, and then obviously the loop will continue executing. All right, so this is not all. What we have to do here is actually do this slicing technique. And I'm going to explain what this now really means. Okay, this stream.write all function just attempts to write the entire slice of data provided to the stream, and then sending it back to the client. And here really we only want to write the bytes we actually also read. So we use a slice of our buffer here. Now this represents the portion of the buffer from the start up to n. So we are not really sending the whole buffer back here. We're just writing a specific slice of our read bytes back to the client. And here clearly because we have the result, the writing can also fail and that's why we have to handle this error here. Now the error for this write all function could be that the write all did not finish because the client just disconnected. Okay, and that was basically it with our really basic, simple TCP echo server. So how are we going to test this functionality now? So what we can say here is just say cargo run and then you can define your address or we're going to use the default one so we can just say cargo run and then the server listens on our localhost and the port 9090 and now we are going to actually test this in a new terminal and what we're going to say here is we are going to echo something like hello world and then we are going to pipe this output of hello world into netcat and netcat is just a really handy tool to interact with our servers or to basically send TCP messages to a server or UDP messages. And here we are going to define the port 9090 and then we basically get a whole world back, which is really nice. And here in the console actually we see that we are handling the connection from and then we have the connection which was netcat in this case and then we can see that we close the connection gracefully and here the connection finished for our peer address which was the same as the handling connection from output here. So that was it and now we've got the most simplistic TCP echo server in Rust. If you are also curious to compare this solution here with the one written in Golang, feel free to check out this video as well. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, have a lovely day and bye bye.